Welcome to The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and myself dive into the heart of the most significant municipal news stories spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. In each episode, we dissect the decisions, explore the dynamic landscape of local governance. And today, we bring you the letter X, which stands for the X Factor. Later in the episode, we'll be joined by Helen Cole, former St. Thomas, Ontario councillor and founder of the Gene Collective. Ian... It looks like you've been on the road again this week. Where are we catching you this fine, beautiful day? I've been everywhere, man. Yeah, today, and in fact, for all week uh, at the time of recording, I've been in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. Uh, I'm here doing a writer's retreat for my new book. I wanted to slam through a whole lot of words and do a bunch of interviews, and it's actually worked really well. It's, uh, it's, It's a whole lot nicer here than it is at home at the moment. No snow, the flowers are out, the birds are out. Sorry. I'm quite jealous, but we do have three big stories that we want to dive into, and we want to start by heading east to Newfoundland and Labrador. Three town councillors have resigned in Stephenville since the beginning of this year, and one of them now accuses the mayor of bullying and saying the town council's toxic culture played a major part in his decision to step down. Lenny Tiller resigned from council on January 11th, citing the need to care for his aging grandparents. However, he told Radio Canada recently that while the need to care for his family remains a primary reason for his departure, the decision was also spurred on by the ridicule he endured at the hands of the mayor, Tom Rose. Quote, the man bullied me. There's no doubt about it. Bullied and degraded multiple, multiple times, said Tiller who is a student aide at a school in St. George's. Quote, I work with kids every day, and one thing we say is always stand up to your bully and you'll be supported. I felt to try, I left to try and find an avenue to stand up, and I feel that's what I'm doing now, end quote. Rose, the mayor, has called Tiller the council's official opposition because he repeatedly voiced concerns related to decisions and expressed made by expenses made by the town and mayor often related to the controversial sale of the Stephenville Airport to the Diamond Group. Now, according to CBC, Mayor Rose, in a phone interview following Tiller's comments, said the former councillor did not reference bullying when he resigned, but only cited his family. And the mayor has denied those bullying allegations. Now, Ian, you are currently in the midst of writing a book, as you just mentioned, around municipal governance and abuse. I've got to pry a little bit here, but how can one determine if something is bullying versus <laughs> opposition of something? You know, Chris, if you uh, if you could answer that question in one line or less, my book would become irrelevant, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, bullying, as far as I've heard from an experienced, is is very subjective. I mean, there are certainly places where it is obvious where the law comes into play. And there are some where you're just looking between two different versions of the truth and trying to figure out which one's the real one. But in the middle is that gray area where somebody says they're being abused and doesn't really give a ton of examples. In this case, where the uh, where the councillor is saying, or the mayor was saying that this councillor takes on the role of official opposition, it could be a philosophical point. They could be trying to make political points. They could be representing a particular group and their particular viewpoint and interests. I don't really know, but it is something that, in this case, the specifics of it um, are are what they are. But in general, it's a real tough, somewhat intractable uh, issue and a topic that I'm writing a whole book about. Now, and this is the reason why I wanted to talk about this story is because you are writing a book right now. Is this something that you're seeing across uh, Canada in the local government sphere where abuse is not just uh, the word abuse, but it's actually taking the form of bullying? Like we are seeing the accusation of bullying in Stephenville. And I say accusation because nothing's been proven and I don't want to get sued by anyone right now. (laughs) Right. And there's a different bar for abuse in different places and with different people culture plays a big part of this that every municipality has its own and unique culture people who get involved in it are either making that culture better or they're making it worse and culture is an outcome of course so it's a result of what's happened over the years and so i mean in this case when it comes to abuse what we're seeing or what we're reading about in stephenville where i've been by the way uh, where it, what we're reading about in Stephenville is not unique. Uh, I've re- encountered this coast, literally coast to coast from BC 
to the Atlantic provinces, of course, with this. I've also interviewed some people in Australia, some elected officials in Australia. If you took away the names and the places, that the general comments would be exactly the same. So I don't, it might be a thing to do with Western democracies. It might be something to do with constitutional monarchies. It might just be something to do with the behavior of people in general in a, in a world where we're now much more interested in instant actions and reactions than we are in sober second thought, for example. Just days after a petition to recall the mayor of Calgary was made public, residents in at least two other Alberta municipalities are looking to recall their leaders. Earlier this month, Debbie Hunker issued a notice for a recall petition. She started to recall the mayor of Wetaskiwin, Tyler Gandum. Now, Mayor Gandum has said to Global News, quote, it's the recall legislation being weaponized by members of communities for elected officials that they don't like or they don't agree with what they're going to say or do. He continued by saying, quote, I think the intention of the legislation was for members of council that did something or so outrageous that the community had a way to make sure they were held accountable. I think disagreeing in terms of what I support for a homeless shelter is really unfortunate, and it takes away from the work that our administration and council is doing, end quote. Now, the village of Donalda shared on its website that it too had received a petition to recall the mayor, Doug Booker. In a letter posted to the website, village chief administrative officer acknowledged receiving a notice of recall petition, saying, quote, the petition was deemed compliant, end quote, and will be considered sufficient if it includes signatures from a minimum of 40% of the population. Now, Donald's current population is 219 residents, which means the petition will require a total of 88 signatures to be considered sufficient. Of the recall petition against him, Doug Booker, the mayor of the village, said, quote, it's unfair and a giant waste of taxpayer time and money, but it has to play itself out. He added, quote, they'll just call another election and I can run again, end quote. Ian, this is the topic that I'm quite interested in. I have said from the outset of recall legislation that this would be used for political reasons and not for the reasons intended. What's the end game here? Do recall legislations actually work? And will this deter people from getting involved? I'm not a fan of recall legislation. Let's just start off the top. To me, it's an outcome uh, you and or I both. a shoot of populism. So if we are electing people because they make the, the, the decisions that the population likes, versus maybe making the tough decisions that the population needs to have made to keep the municipality sustainable over time, then that may be unpopular. And getting rid of somebody because they make an unpopular decision is one thing. Getting rid of somebody because they make an illegal decision is another. And there are different routes for that, of course. There is disqualification provisions in a lot of legislation. There are elections that happen. There is the judiciary that can take care of the severe cases as well and replace municipal elected officials there. This legislation is new in Alberta, uh, new as of the uh, 2021 term. It actually came into effect in 2022. And you mentioned some of the places that we've seen it. So I had I did a quick scan and I've, I've seen it in, uh, you and Donalda you mentioned, we know about a high profile case in Calgary with the mayor. Uh, Riley is the only successful uh, instance of recall where they, the village actually re did recall their mayor. Uh, we've seen the city of Medicine Hat, Lamont County, the city of Wetaskiwin with Mayor Gandam, as you have referenced, and there may be others as well. But all of those are since it came into effect in 2022. And to me, you met, both mayors mentioned this as a bit of a distraction. And I think they're right that this is not something that I, I'm a fan of. I don't think in the long in the long term it's going to be good for a, a local elected officials who are trying to make difficult decisions in the best long term interest of their communities. I I have all, I, I wrote a blog about this recently when right. uh, the recall legislation uh, was called upon uh, Mayor Gondek. This is I don't want to say distraction. I I'm I'm glad the threshold is high. 
And yep. and I know there's a lot of people who are against the proponent of having it 40% of the residents in that re in that community. Yet yet again, when you have Donald uh, where it's only 219 members, means 88 people that needs to sign the petition, probably likely it's going to happen. In a larger city, probably highly unlikely it's going to happen. There is a possibility it may, but I don't see it happening. Mm -hmm. I How do I ask this question without asking the stupid question, but is this going to be something that we're going to see a lot more of into the next few years? Because you say it's sort of partial, part and partial with the populist movement, and we are seeing that mm -hmm. rise across Canada and around the world. Um, anything that someone doesn't like anymore, 18 months after the last election, you can file a petition to get someone recalled now in Alberta. Yeah, I, I don't think, well, then the big cities... Calgary is the best example of that. It's, it's extraordinarily unlikely that this will actually come to pass, but it is a shot across the bow of the mayor and other members of council as well who may be agreeing with the mayor that we, a, a significant portion of the population, 5%, 10%, don't, don't like you or your decisions enough that we will put our names down on a piece of paper. Of course, as you said, the bar is pretty high and there's a bit of a nuance to the legislation in Alberta the difference between residents and electors and electors of course are a subset of residents but the total number you need in terms of signatures is total number of residents even though a large chunk of them can't actually vote for age or residency or citizenship or all sorts of things so i think it is going to happen more and more but i think it's going to be used more and more as a warning not necessarily with intention of actually being able to remove somebody another quirk of the legislation in alberta and the donald mayor mentioned this is that strangely, if you are disqualified from office in some fashion, you can run in the election to replace yourself. There is no go sit in the corner and think about it for a term or ter two terms like there is elsewhere in the country. I just don't think it's a good idea. And it applies to school board trustees and it applies to MLAs as well. And because those constituencies are so large, it's very unlikely that they would be recalled. We, so I was looking at that prior to this. So some some areas, yes, it is quite high for a large portion of the population, forty percent. But some ridings, hypothetically, because I was I was I, I like to do math and I like to sort of get in analogies. In Brooks Medicine Hat, a riding that is run by the UCP, you only yeah. who is the current premier, Daniel Smith, you only need about six thousand signatures to recall and five hundred dollars. So. It is a story that I will be watching uh, closely yeah. over the next two years and see if something happens. But hopefully, hopefully no. it's not used in the wrong way. No, we... there are lots of politicians I don't agree with, but they were legitimately elected. I say let them serve out their terms unless they do something particularly egregious, which raises the attention of the justice system. Now to our last story, we're heading back into Eastern Canada. A year in rural municipalities created during local governance reforms in New Brunswick have been working to form community and get new politicians up to speed. New Brunswick local government reforms, which took effect in January of 2023, combined the village of Norton with LSDs of Cars and Wickham and parts of the Norton and Upham LSDs to create the village of Valley Waters and formed the rural community of Butternut Valley. From all our part of four unincorporated local service districts, including Havelock, Studholm, Brunswick, and Johnson. Now, Butternut Valley's population was an estimated about 5,300 with a 2024 tax base of just under 484,000. Valley Water's population was estimated at 4,400 with a tax base of approximately 486,000. Now, Valley Water Mayor Randy McKnight says they've been coming together and building community identity over the last year, including working on a strategic plan. But in Butternut Valley, where there was no original municipality to build off of, Mayor Alan Brown said it's taken a while for things to get going. Budget constraints involving provincial costs have made the municipalities, quote, more like caretakers, end quote. He also went on to say, quote, we sort of thought that we'd have the ability to enact some improvements in the area. We have undertaken various studies to look at wastewater, water supply, some economic development, things like that. But we are finding in reality that we're limited on what we can do because of the cost being downloaded from the province. 
end quote. The regional services commissions have also been mandated by the province to handle waste collections, planning services, regional cost sharing for recreational and other newer responsibilities, including, but not limited to, economic development and tourism. Ian, these reforms in New Brunswick have been on the top of mind for a lot of politicians in the province. And when I speak to mayors and councillors in New Brunswick, I find it hard to not talk about these reforms when talking about the state of municipal governments in the province. While these entities, these new municipalities are still young, are the first years of a municipality after amalgamation the hardest? Or is it, as we always say on the show, it's never about the thing it's about? It's never about what it's about. Absolutely. This is an interesting case study, and I think people will be looking at this for a while. It was a bit of a crash course in municipal amalgamation, where the province, and you mentioned it off the beginning, amalgamated a series of smaller municipalities into a smaller number of large municipalities. We've actually been working in New Brunswick a bit ourselves with a municipality that used to be six. And one of the quirks to it, and you mentioned it in terms of LSDs or local service districts, is some of the people who are on these new councils have never been part of a municipal government before. So they don't, they've don't they heard of it, but they don't really know how it operates. And in the first year, I believe, that the province, after amalgamation, handed these places their CAOs, and they handed them a budget and said, go forth. So they have been constrained from the start. Now that we're a year and a bit in, we're starting to see some of those chunks, uh, the dominoes starting to fall, and some of the CAOs are moving on too. And what we're seeing from some places where there are these people who've never been on a municipal council or municipal councillors who were part of a tiny place and now are part of a bigger place is that the job isn't what they thought it was going to be, which gets us back to here. It's never about what it's about. So people haven't been part of a municipality. The job is more than they expected it was going to be. They were amalgamated uh, from, from on high. It wasn't a case like Manitoba where they said, hey, go find some friends or some dance partners or we'll do it for you. Uh, this didn't happen in New Brunswick where the amalgamations happened. I'd say too that as this thing is forming, these municipalities are forming and there was a reference in their strategic planning. I think that that is critical to get a common understanding of the, the direction of the place. However, even before that, I think there needs to be an understanding for a common understanding of what local government does. So, so the strategic plan doesn't talk about things like health or housing or defense or immigration. It's actually sticking to the things that local government can actually concentrate on. So the strat plan does have to be there, but only once council understands their job, understands who they are and what their role is. It's it's going to be it's going to be a tough role for, for a few years. I, I'm just going to do a shameless plug here, but Ian, do you know a company that would be a great addition <laughs> to help work with the strategic planning <laughs> sessions? Well, I, I may in fact have it on the on the name on my screen here. Yeah, as strategic steps, because of our Atlantic operation now, we're getting way more involved in local governments in the four Atlantic provinces and I'm really beginning to understand some of the nuanced differences between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, for example, where uh, we haven't done much in PEI yet, but the other three provinces we certainly have and learning a lot as we go. So if you want to learn more and reach out to Ian to talk about strategic planning and even their Atlantic office, uh, of the links are in the show notes. We'll be right back with Helen Cole, former St. Thomas counselor and the founder of the Gene Collective. Welcome to X is for the X Factor on the political trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is none other than Helen Cole, founder of the Gene Collective. The Gene Collective stands as a beacon of empowerment and advocacy dedicated to cultivating a landscape where every woman is equipped, encouraged, and empowered to assume leadership roles. Rooted in the belief that informed and educated women are the bedrock of a vibrant electorate, the collective tirelessly advocates for change, striving to forge parity in politics, particularly within the realm of municipal governance. Central to their ethos is an unwavering commitment to inclusivity and non-discrimination. The Gene Collective recognizes the and celebrates the rich tapestry of humanity, rejecting discrimination based on ethnicity, language, race, age, ability, sex, sexual orientation, income, political, or religious affiliation. Now, a key focus of the Gene Collective is the empowerment of the next generation of women. 
Now at the forefront of the Gene Collective is none other than our guest, Helen Cole, a dedicated advocate for women's leadership and empowerment with a remarkable 35 year career spanning local governance and nonprofit sector. From serving in various capacities in Chatham, Kent, St. Thomas, Elgin, and Sarnia, Lambton, Cole's passion for community engagement has remained unwavering. The Gene Collective is not merely an organization, it is a movement fueled by the collective strength and determination of women. Together, they can champion change, dismantle barriers, and pave the way for the future where every woman can realize their full potential and contribute meaningfully to the fabric of society. So with that, welcome to the political trenches, Helen. Thank you. And uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, that was very powerful and really meaningful to me. Thank you so much. I, I am so looking forward to this conversation. Ian and I have been chatting about this prior to recording, and it seems like your organization does tremendous work. But as the episode is titled, X is for the X Factor, I'm wondering if you can, with that description of what the Gene Collective is and your background, if you could for a moment, Helen, describe what is the X factor? What is the factor that goes into making a good leader in 2024? Well, it won't be just one factor. Um, it's a blend of the several qualities. And for women in politics, there are some that hold special significance. For example, um, authenticity. It's so important that we don't try to be someone that we're not, that we show ourselves and so that the public feels that they can trust you. You need to be true to yourself and have a genuine connection to what your beliefs and your values are. Next, I would say resilience is so important. Politics can be tough. And for women, it can be even tougher due to a lot of systemic and societal barriers. So resilience is really key. I think that next would be strong listening and communication skills. It's very important that you are able to empathize with members of the public, whether you decide to run for office, perhaps you're looking at leadership roles in your community. So strong listening and communication skills results in effective communication. And that is just so important. Um, I think having a vision and a passion for what you believe in and your integrity, so important that you know what you stand for. Uh, there's a quote, um, but it won't come to me right now about <laughs> if you don't know what you stand for, then you'll fall for anything, pretty much <laughs> is it. So when it's really important, whether you're making decisions as a leader in your community or you're making decisions as a woman, politician. <laughs> All right. Well, I will take over at this point, too, and look specifically at getting women involved in local government. Uh, and of course, they're not 50. It's not even close to 50-50 in terms of either uh, mayors, wardens, right. councillors, any of those sort of things. But hopefully the trend is starting to move. You probably know more about that than we do. But what do you see as some of the most significant barriers to getting more women involved in or participating in local government in elected roles or advisory roles? Well, there is the fact that it is it is improving, but in the past, we haven't had a lot of role models that we can follow. Um, as I said, that is improving, but that is one of the barriers. Um, women also are very hard on themselves in that they have expectations of perfection. They, they've got to be able to do everything just right. Whereas in public office, you're not going to know everything. And that's why you have staff to help and advise. Mm -hmm. But you, you will learn as you grow. Um, when you are first elected, you are presented with so much 
information that it can feel overwhelming, but um, just relax, realize that you've been elected because think people think you can make a difference and you can. And so um, there is also expectations around a woman's leadership style. And it was a long time ago now that I was on council, but I did run into the fact that effective leaders were often perceived that they must be assertive, dominant, divisive, decisive rather. <clears throat> if women leaders, it's a very fine line for a woman leader to walk because they're going to be criticized one way or another. But what we bring is different styles like collaborative leadership. And we do have to fight against the fact that our methods could be perceived or questioned, which can impact our perception of what our leadership should look like. Does that help you? Yeah, I'm sure there are some systemic barriers that are in place that need to be dismantled probably over time. You made a reference earlier to culture, for example, and well, that it's not something that we change overnight in terms of culture or expectations. But how do we get more more women to decide to step up to that plate? Then, if we if you've talked about the the attributes, we've talked about getting rid of some of the barriers, but how do we actually convince them that it'd be a good idea to stand up or step up and represent the community? What I've observed in the last few years is that women often think they can't do it. They may have grown up in a family where politics is discussed at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. They may have a deep political orientation, but still, they think they can't do it. What I hear is, politics? Oh, no, I'm not going there. I, I just don't know enough. I don't have enough knowledge. We continually sell ourselves short. Are you finding more and more women not wanting to go into the realm of leadership roles because of the, and I, and I, I, I'm a big proponent that social media has been the downfall of our society. It is a place where people can just complain, uh, attack with uh, behind their screens. There's no name attached and people can just bitch. And I apologize and moan about what's going on in the world. Are you finding when you're talking to women in who are prospective leadership roles saying, I don't want to put myself through that. I don't want to put my family through those negative attacks that uh, comes with being in a leadership role in 2024. Yes. Um, that is because definitely... I can imagine the, the, the abuse that is today. And I, this is what's going to be my follow-up question. The abuse that uh, women in leadership are getting today is not the same type of abuse that you may have gotten while you were on council in the 1990s. You're right. Um, my abuse mostly came by phone calls um, because we social media wasn't a factor then. Or I can remember certainly one time after a meeting when I made a decision in a committee that one of my committee members didn't agree with and he threatened me outside in the parking lot um, and that was frightening and that can still happen today but with regards to uh, thank goodness we have integrity commissioners now um, but with regard to social media that is an issue some of the best advice I have heard from anyone and you will know if you looked at my website that I have a variety of interviews on there and I don't know if it, if it was in the interview or if it was afterwards, but a very long time um, politician woman told me that the best thing a woman could do in terms of their social media was have someone else handle it for them. And I had a friend who ran for mayor recently, and, and that is what she had to do. It became very... Um, it was it was not a friendly um, campaign. And um, so she had two young staffers that every day they went in and they took care of the nasties, if you will, on her social media. I think that I, if I were running, for sure, I would be doing that. Um, 
Isn't it a shame though, that a keyboard warrior can have that kind of power over you? They're, they're too afraid to talk to you in person or to say, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this, but they're quite happy to attack you on, on social media. I'd like to change direction if I can just a little bit as we come kind of closer to the end of the uh, of this, this this line of questioning, and that is about trends and things. Are you seeing any trends? You, you talked about the twenty percent representation a little while ago. We've talked about some of the barriers that you're seeing to participation, but trends either in your province, in the country, or even international. Do you do you know what's happening in terms of getting more women involved? I am seeing more women um, getting elected at all levels of government. I think we have about 30 years to go before we reach mm -hmm. parity, however. Um, in 2022, I supported 20 women who were running for public office. And we definitely, I want to say we increased to 30% in 2022. We've definitely um, increased our representation. So we're on the way. We've got more work to do. And, and of course, I'm not going to be here forever. So I'm hoping that I can bring more people along who will help to keep this growing and will continue to support women in politics and in leadership roles. Are you getting interest from outside Ontario? There is some, but here's the challenge. Um, the roles are different. The so in terms of being very specific of public about public office, that can be a bit challenging. But here's what is the same. What I discovered is women didn't want to ask for money. Oh, I can't ask for money. And yet they were totally shocked at what the campaign would cost them. So they need to learn how to ask for money. A perfect example is me. Um, I have to call and ask people for money to fund my conferences. And every single time I pick up that phone, I hate doing it. And the old imposter syndrome rears its ugly head. Yeah. That's the same that happens with women who are running for office. So mm. they need to be stronger about asking for money. They need to develop their campaign. They need to know what their platform is, which then again takes you back to what their values are and what they stand for. I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule and doing this interview, talking about what goes into a good leadership of women in politics and municipal governance, but also sort of the systematic barriers that women face as well. We wish you all the best in your two upcoming events, and I really hope they are a smash. Thank you so very much. It's my honor to be featured in this podcast. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. My only question is, can I come back again? <laughs> <laughs> you name me the time and place, Helen. <laughs> our, so so our full so much. Our full interview with Helen will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Ian, we are two episodes away from finishing the municipal alphabet X's for the X Factor. Another great episode, another great interview with Helen Cole, the founder of the Gene Collective. How do you think the episode went today? All right, two letters. First of all, two letters. That's now quite astounding. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I thought, I thought uh, it was, it was. The passion that just exuded through Helen was just fantastic and, and infectious. And it's no wonder that she was getting some really good referrals to get her on the show here for the people we talked to. Not surprised in the least. So we are uh, going to be away uh, next week with our full interview with Helen, but we will be back in March. What do you have planned for the next two weeks there, Ian? Are you going to be traveling still or are you going to be back in uh, good old Alberta? I'm heading back to Alberta today, actually, um, which is before the episode comes <laughs> out. So if you could have the snow gone by then, I'd appreciate it. But, I'll, I'll uh, try I and just, shovel it while I'm up there today. <laughs> thanks very much. There's uh, there's a little bit of, of travel, but just within the province over the next little while. My main or one of my primary focus, of course, is to uh, is to finish writing this book, or at least make get another multiple thousands of words through this book and and complete some more interviews as as part of it as well. 
And I, I should note, I'm kind of holding off the surprise even for Ian here for a second, but I kind of alluded to it last night in our text message exchange. But we're going to be at FCM. We are going to be at a Alberta conference, uh, the Alberta sort of uh, event on opening night on June 6th. So be sure to check out that. Uh, Ian and I will be in all our glory. I'm not sure if we're going to be doing a live recording, but we will be there in person mingling with all you amazing people who have made this show possible, but also who have tuned in week after week and listened to us talk about local governance. So I'm excited to be in Calgary for FCM this year, and I'm excited that we are part of uh, showcasing the great municipalities that is Alberta as well. Are you? That will be fun. <laughs> uh, we're also, a Strategic Steps, going to be a big part of the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators Conference, or CAMA which is in Banff, kind of piggyback, not piggybacking on it, but around the same time, but uh, slightly different dates, different location. Perfection. Until then, Ian, always a pleasure. It's always been a blast to sit down with you and talk about the political trenches, local government at work. See you next time.